Hey, hey, I'm back from some travel. I went to the Stansbury Conference in Boston. It was at the Encore in Boston. And then I spoke at the Money Show in Orlando. And then next week I have a trip to the Cayman Islands. And then I have a trip to New York. And then I have another trip to New York. So lots of stuff going on. Then in December, I have my writing sabbatical to write my book. So I'll be out the month of December. But life is good. Hope it's good for you too. Today I want to talk about the wealth effect. And I don't know if you ever heard of this, but this is when the stock market's going up, the housing market's going up, and people are getting richer and they're feeling richer. And because they're feeling richer, they spend more money and it speeds up the economy and you have sort of this positive feedback loop. The wealth effect is real, for sure. The wealth effect is real. And like when I'm making money in the markets, I'm definitely spending more money, for sure. Like actually, sometimes I do it on purpose. Sometimes I'll have a trade that goes really, really well and I'll be like, well, I need to reward myself, so I'm going to buy a watch or I'll buy some clothes or something like that. And I, I do it on purpose, you know. Um, it's absolutely a real thing. So, and keep in mind, I don't, I don't spend a lot of money. I would bet that my monthly credit card bills are lower than yours. I really don't spend much money. I go out to lunch, go to the drugstore, shit like that. Like, I, you know, I think on an average month, I, in discretionary expenses, I spend like $2,000 a month, and that's it. So, but when I'm making money in the PA, and the PA is the personal account, when I'm making money in the PA, I'm definitely feeling a little bit spendy. So, so right now, what do you think the wealth effect is doing? The wealth effect is going in reverse. People are losing money in stocks. In their houses. So, and one thing to keep in mind, and a lot of people don't really understand this, the stock market's down about 20%, okay, which is bad. But in the context of all the bear markets in history, is really not that bad. I mean, we've had much worse bear markets, even in recent history, 2008, 2001, 1974, 1929. We've had some really big bear markets where stocks were down 50%. This isn't one of those times. Stocks are down 20%. But what makes this unique is that this is the worst year for the bond market since 1788, the, day, the, the year after the Constitution was drafted. It's the worst year for bonds. Ever, like, it's since the 1700s. So what you have is, I mean, you have a destruction of wealth in the stock market, and you have an even bigger destruction of wealth in the bond market. And combined... You have a destruction of wealth that is pretty much equal to what happened in the financial crisis. It's just as bad. So, you know, for all these people that have target date funds in their 401ks, you know, a target date fund is basically a balanced fund that has equities and fixed income. Like these target date funds are down like 20, 25 percent. This is the this is a terrible drawdown that people are having. So. I guess the one difference is, is that people do have a lot of savings. And this is one thing that the, keep, the Fed keeps focusing on is the amount of savings that people have. And people are still spending money. But there is such a thing as a negative wealth effect. So I think people, un the other thing is, I think people intuitively understood that 2008 could have been the end of the world. I mean, we were on the brink. And maybe that's a discussion for another time. I can talk about how close we were to the financial system completely blowing to pieces and going into a depression. We were that close. And I think people intuitively understood that. And that's the difference between this time. This time is, you know, it's a rate hike cycle. It's, it's really, it's not that big of a deal. So the problem is if you're living in the financial world like I am, I'm, you know, I'm on Twitter and I'm talking to people and I'm just totally plugged into this financial world in the financial world, people panic all the time. You know, people panicked during the bull market from like 2011 to 2019. Anytime we would have a 3% correction, people would panic. And I was part of that. I would do that too. Absolutely. And people in finance tend to make a much bigger deal about things than they actually are. What you really, 
what you really need to do is put yourself in the shoes of an individual investor who has some investments in a 401k. And for that person, a 20% drawdown really is not that big of a deal in the context of their entire career. It's really not. And I don't think this is a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal, but, you know, we're going to survive, okay? We're going to survive, just like we survived the explicit lyrics in the 90s, just like we survived being kids in the 1980s. We're going to survive this. So I think people in the real world have a lot more perspective. You know, if, if the market goes down 20%, it'll come back. You know, they're not too worried about it. That's what they say. It'll come back. I, I talk to people like that all the time, you know, and I do think there will be one or two situations in our lifetime where we really do have to worry about the market not coming back, but I don't think this is one of those times. I really don't. So in this respect, average people are smarter than financial people. It's because they have a long time horizon and they have strong hands. You know, they take a long view. And another belief that is common in the financial world is that you can't find a bottom in the bear market until all the retail investors capitulate, until they panic and they just puke and they sell and then we can find a bottom. I don't think that's necessarily the case. You know, it would take a lot for people to capitulate. I mean, you'd have to get the stock market down like 50%. The retail investors are the strong hands. It's the professional investors that are the weak hands. They're the weak hands. They're the ones that are panicking when stocks are down like 8%. So I, w I would not count on this mass capitulation from retail investors. It's not going to happen. And I do think that we can have a bottom in the stock market without that capitulation. So, and that's what I'm saying. I'm saying you're smarter than the pros, you know, and oftentimes that's true. 20%. It's not that big of a deal. It's not. None of this is a big deal. And then you see, then you go on Twitter and you see these doofs talking about how we're going into a depression. Man, that is not going to happen. It is not going to happen. So that's your financial therapist appointment for the week. <laughs> you should really feel better. Like, really, you should feel pretty good about how things are going right now. I mean, really, like we, we hiked Fed funds like 4% in less than a year. You know, like in the economy didn't crash and the stock market didn't crash and everything's OK, you know, so. And let's say let's say the market does go down 30 or 40 percent, doesn't really change what you do, you know, you, and if it does change what you do, then you have a problem, right? Because if you're one of these people where stocks go down 30 percent and you're like, oh, shit, like uh, now I, I'm scared, I can't contribute to my 401k anymore, then what what you're doing is you're it's suboptimal behavior. Like you have to keep sending in those checks. You have to keep investing in all environments. Because what you're trying to do is keep up with the index. You're trying to get the average return, you know. So I talk about this study a lot. Um, in 2019, J.P. Morgan did this fascinating study. And they looked at the markets between 1999 and 2019. And over that time period, which had two crashes, right, 2001 and 2008, over that time period, which had two crashes, the stock market returned 5.6% a year. So think about that. In a 20-year period with two major crashes, two great bear markets, the stock market still returned 5.6% a year. But here's the funny part. The funny part is that the average investor returned 1.9%. Much worse in the stock market. Worse in the bond market. They actually did worse in the bond market. And if you think about this even more, that's the average person. So, a lot, you know, a lot of people are below average. So you had people who were losing money in a 20-year period where stocks returned almost 6%. And that happens throughout history, you know. And it's because of suboptimal investor behavior. People get scared on the lows. They stop contributing. They get excited on the highs. They contribute more. It's just human behavior, you know. Now, keep in mind, I am not a stocks for the long run guy, okay? Uh, I still haven't met Jeremy Siegel. I haven't met him. I've been on the radio with him a couple times, but I haven't met him in person. 
Uh, I've read that book. I read Stocks for the Long Run years ago. It's now in its sixth printing, right? I don't know that I agree with it for a whole bunch of reasons. And, you know, we, we've already chewed up a bunch of time in this podcast, and I don't want to get into it. But let's just say that the conditions that led to the stock market return for the last 100 years may not be present for the next 100 years, okay? So I'm not a stocks for the long run guy, but for the time being, I am. And I also want to say that if you only invest in stocks for your retirement, then you're a fool. You have to diversify across asset classes. You at least have to have some bonds, especially now. Now's a good time to invest in bonds. Gee whiz. Like you can get like 6% on investment grade corporates. It's an amazing deal. Get like 9 or 10% on high yield. It's fantastic. Like, why wouldn't you do this? You know? But yeah, you should take a long view. And I think I think the chance that we put in new highs next year is, is, you know, I think it's reasonable. I think it could happen. I just don't want you to panic. Remember, I am the guy that tells you not to experience financial stress. And a lot of financial stress is your attitude. You can choose to stress about this stuff or you can choose not to stress about this stuff. I have been through a lot of bull and bear markets. I've been through times when I felt rich and I've been through times when I felt poor. Now I feel poor. <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> it does. It sucks. But I have never felt poor and stayed poor, you know, and usually at some point I'm falling ass backwards into money again. And sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's hard. You know, right now I'm feeling poor because I got a lot of money going out the door for this house. And that sucks. But that will pass. The Wall Street people have a saying for this. They say, easy come, easy go. And I totally believe that. Easy. That's the way it's been my whole life. Easy come, easy go. Although, it would be nice if it was easy come, hard go. Right? Like, you make some money, you want to hang on to the money. You want to hang on to your gains. Anyway, um, the trips were fantastic. Uh, the Stansbury Conference was awesome. I got to DJ the conference, and it was huge amounts of fun. And people were actually digging the music. It was fun. Uh, the Money Show was a bust. Uh, it was a very old crowd, like really old. Um, my session that I spoke at was probably the youngest crowd in the Money Show. So... About 15 people were there. They were all like market junkies, smart guys, you know, and had a good conversation. It was great. You know, I didn't get any business out of it, but oh well, you know. Um, I was kind of led to believe that I would be speaking on the main stage. And I don't know if you've ever done this, if you have any experience public speaking, but it, it, the type of speech you prepare depends on whether you're in a big room or a small room. You know, a small room is very intimate and you really want to be talking to people and a big room is like a speech. You want to be giving a speech, a presentation, because there's kind of distance between you and the audience. So I thought I was going to be in a big room, and I had prepared this very formal speech, and it was a room of 15 people, and it was, it just, I, would have been nice to know, let's put it that way. So, uh, Stephanie Pomboy was speaking on the main stage, and I'm like, you know, I, she's terrific, but I, I bet that I have at least as big of a following as she does. So I think she has better PR people. She's in Barron's all the time. So I don't have any PR people. So by definition, she has better PR people. So Stephen Moore was there. Uh, I saw him walking down the hall. His shirt was like totally untucked, <laughs> just his shirt hanging out. And I'm like, you know, it's funny. It's you really you got to be concerned about your appearance, especially if you're like a TV personality. You know, you don't want to be walking in the middle of a conference with your shirt hanging out. So, uh, yeah, anyway, that's it for today. So, the, I mean, the moral of the story is just chill out like it's going to be OK. And I'm pretty bullish on stocks. here. I mean, I've been bullish for a while, but I really think it's going to be OK. Thanks for listening to the Be Smart Podcast. I'm Jared Dillian. See you next time.